Okay. Hello and welcome. Today's PSU Transportation Seminar, and it's the main one, and I will be introducing and moderating today's seminar. And, okay, next slide. So uh, our PSU Transportation Seminar has been a tradition since year 2000. The seminars are once again being ha held uh, live on PSU's urban campus, located on the ancestral homelands of the Monoma, Klafmet, Klakmas, Tom Water, and Walala bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin, Kalabuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is important to acknowledge that we are here because of the sacrifices forced on the indigenous ancestors of this place. Remember these communities to honor their legacies, lives, and distance. Today, we are very pleased to have Adam Argo and Jonathan Slayson uh, presenting on Oregon Transportation Plan, uh, innovations in the exploratory scenario planning approach. Adam Argo, EICP, is a principal planner in the uh, Oregon Department of Transportation, or ODOT, as Transportation Planning Unit. He leads the development refinement and implementation of statewide multimodal transportation plans, policies, and strategies. Adam act as a agency project manager for ODA's recently completed update to, to uh, Oregon transportation plan. He has 25 years of transportation and land use planning experience in both the public and private sector is a certified planner through uh, American Planning Association and holds a BA in political science and master's mm -hmm. in urban planning, both from the University of Kansas. Jonathan Slayson PE is a director in RSG's planning application practice. He has provided professional engineering and planning consulting service to the public and private clients for over 15 years. He has worked both nationally and internationally on land use policy and planning, design projects, more recently long range planning, emphasizing climate and equity goals. <laughs> he leads RSG's strategic modeling practice with a focus on exploratory plan, scenario planning and currently is assisting Federal Highway Administration and others to enhance the strategic, strategic modeling vision of our platform. Here is a preview of uh, our upcoming and last scenario. Uh, last, last uh, seminar, uh, two minute scenarios in uh, previous slides. So, uh, as an overview of today's seminar, we uh, you can expect our speakers to present for about 40 minutes, followed by a QA. Uh, we'll be receiving questions through. Uh, the QMA feature on your control panel, if you're watching online, of course. And uh, and uh, for those online questions, we'll ask them at the end of the presentation. If we run out of time for all your questions, we will give you uh, our speakers the opportunity to email written responses uh, for any questions left un and un unanswered. We have enabled closed captions uh, but you must click on the CC feature on your control panel to view them. We'll be recording today's webinar. Uh, it will be available on our website later today along with the presentation slices. If you are track, tracking professional development hours, the webinar is eligible for one hour of continued education credit. Uh, with that, I will hand over to uh, Adam. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Dr. Wong, and to Becca and to the PSU Trek team for accommodating us, uh, Jonathan and myself today, to talk about a lot of things, scenario planning, 
and some things regarding uh, Oregon's particular aspects of planning. Uh, I want to just acknowledge that the process of updating the Oregon Transportation Plan was an intensive one involving a lot of people and want to uh, just send a note of thanks to my ODOT colleagues, which are here in attendance, um, to the consultant team of which Jonathan was, on, was one of them, uh, another consultant team members in the audience today. Um, we had a large consultant team primed by HDR Engineering. <laughs> RSG was one of the very important partners. Other key partners included Alta Planning and Design, uh, WSP, um, Multicultural Collaborative. There are uh, so many to name that I, I couldn't possibly really take the time to properly acknowledge all the people involved. But I'm certainly grateful uh, that we've come to this point today so much due to their involvement in this work. Thank you, Becca. So a couple of notes to make up front uh, with this slide. We will use the acronym OTP to reference the Oregon Transportation Plan throughout this presentation. And as there are different categories of scenario planning utilized in the practice, we consider the OTP scenario planning process to be exploratory. Exploratory scenarios ask the question, what can happen? In contrast to normative scenarios that ask, question around how can a certain target be reached. The analytical tools utilized by the OTP project team have enabled a robust state of the practice exploratory scenario planning methodology. Later in this presentation, Jonathan will expound further on the scenario planning technology and how the team took advantage of these tools. The OTP defines the long range transportation policy through the year 2050 for the movement of people and goods across the state. The OTP focuses on the users and uses of the transportation system, balancing diverse needs and guiding investments programs and processes. It identifies a vision and actionable direction for all entities that deliver transportation services. That includes state agencies, regional and local governments, transit agencies, and more. The OTP directs the work of the Oregon Department of Transportation, AKA ODOT, and was adopted by the Oregon Transportation Commission earlier this year, that would be in July. The Oregon Transportation Commission is the state approval authority and they adopt the OTP as part of their legal responsibility and authority under state statute. Collectively, the OTP with the adopted mode and topic plan components, such as the Oregon Public Transportation Plan, the Oregon Highway Plan, and the Oregon Transportation Safety Action Plan constitute the state's transportation system plan. The OTP is also consistent with federal direction for the development and content of a long-range statewide transportation plan and federal codified rules that implement the Federal Highway Administration and the Federal Transit Administration's transportation planning regulations. So this slide relates my admittedly ponderous and philosophical approach to conducting the update to the OTP and managing the process within my role in the agency. I recognize too many individuals making up the project team as I noted before. And that includes ODOT's executive leadership as well as my management chain, fellow agency staff, consultant team and public private partners. They were advising throughout the process. So to touch on first principles that I think about before we scope, we, well, actually, after we scope the plan, but before we really embarked on the process, it's definitely considering the who, the what, the how, the why. Uh, Long-range plans really need to kind of start from a, why are we doing this? Uh, before we get to the where are we going. There are so many people that constitute the who, and that includes not just the project team and agency, agencies, um, employees and staff and elected officials, it's, it's everyone in Oregon. And the what and the how is what we're gonna get into quite a bit uh, in our presentation today. Playing to the strengths of the process using the tools, we'll be talking a lot about tools today, um, but it's, in my mind, applying a prescriptive 
and descriptive approach accordingly and where those elements fit in in the overall process. And it's about making complexity of the system relatable. Uh, my own personal uh, philosophical approach in uh, planning as a discipline, as a profession, and a practice is grounded in complex system theory. We're going to talk a little bit about that here, um, as well as theory of change. So, in considering the key aspects of the scenario planning approach to updating the OTP, I look to resources such as the book Scenario Planning for Cities and Regions, Managing and Envisioning Uncertain Futures. That was published in 2020 by Robert Goodspeed. He's assistant professor of the University of Michigan's Talbot College of Architecture and Urban Planning. The diagram shown here is cited in the book. It reflects a community system with the number and complexity of the physical and artificial networks being a factor of urban area size. Now we would commonly recognize the physical networks that include transportation, water, and utilities, but the abstract legal, institutional, social, and less visible ecological systems are just as important. They're germane to how I think about uh, this plan process. From the aspect of developing a resilient plan then, I consciously try to show how the institutional network of governance interrelates with the more easily measured and observed systems of infrastructure, material goods, and energy. So this is uh, where I wanna talk about a way to organize the long range planning process with an intensive public outreach component and the o which the OTP certainly had and in consideration of how the prescriptive and the descriptive are respectively positioned. Prescriptive is really about asking the questions, what information do we need in this process? How will we make informed choices and come to agreement? And as a project team, it's deploying these tools. PMP, by the way, stands for Project Management Plan. PI slash O slash C stands for Public Involvement, Outreach, and Communication Plan. Charters. Uh, agreements for the people we uh, bring to the table in advisorial capacities um, are giving them their roles and responsibilities and their scope to ensure effective outcomes when they come together throughout the process. Media releases, uh, which we did an extent amount of that, as well as background reports that really help uh, develop the baseline of knowledge that we need to have in place uh, for the plan. Then we go to a descriptive element. Descriptive is about going to people who actually use the, and interact with the system every day. It's trying to understand what's happening in transportation. What's happening in transportation for a, a, a mother with a single mother with young children who needs to get her uh, kids to uh, critical appointments? Um, it's about others that may live in other regions throughout the state uh, that need to uh, get agricultural goods uh, delivered to market. It's um, just trying to understand these different perspectives, using a robust practice to get some sweet, some aspect of knowledge and understanding of those things. And then asking the question, how is the system working or is it not working for you? And those tools are definitely including virtual engagement tools. We certainly live in the time of COVID throughout this process <laughs> of um, updating the plan. So we had even heavier virtual engagement than was expected when I started scoping this project in uh, front of 2020 with my management chain. We utilize tools such as the virtual open house pretty robust online engagement uh, to be able to um, impart the information to audiences and get some aspect of feedback, different ways, survey instruments, for instance. Um, we utilized focus groups. And I wanna make a note that part of that were in language focus groups because we centered equity throughout the, uh, the process of this plan. And that included going to communities and getting meaningful input from them um, 
where traditionally ODOT has struggled and had um, plenty of uh, history where they weren't going to those communities. So intentionalizing those kind of equitable approaches is, is incredibly important in that descriptive aspect of this process. And then uh, transportation personas relates to an actual analytical tool we utilize uh, for um, this plan update process, where we synthesize actual demographic uh, data uh, in the state uh, to certain segments and um, created these kind of uh, avatars or personas so that when we related that out in our public engagement tools that we used online, people might see themselves in these certain personas that we described of how maybe that was a great analog for how they um, use utilize the system and how they need to get their needs met, whether they're on the Oregon coast in the smaller communities or in the Portland region or out in Eastern Oregon and, and in more rural and exurban areas. And then back to a descriptive progress uh, process aspect of the process, excuse me. Given what we know about X, what could happen? Why? What should we do? And this is where we're really going to talk about, uh, and Jonathan is really going to expound on the ask, those prescriptive aspects in scenario planning and where the scenario planning process and our findings as we started working our, uh, our models were in, would inform what we uh, built into our, what we called the open online open house too. Um, so that would relate informed choices. So it would tell people across a wide swath of, um, of Oregon in terms of geographies, in terms of age, uh, in terms of the communities, um, in terms of whatever segmentation you could probably think of is that um, they would recognize what the scenarios told, mean to them in terms of uh, where we think we're going in a very uncertain future and um, where we could go. So we use the term drivers of change to mean exogenous pressures that shape changes to the state's transportation system. The six drivers shown on this slide connect to OTP goal areas and policies. There's a vast disparity in changes to demographics and industry composition in rural versus urban areas. These disparities are visible in how the transportation system is impacted. For instance, rural areas experience experiencing out migration, and that's reducing overall transportation demand. In urban areas, on the other hand, there is increased populations. That is straining the transportation system. There are dramatic increases in demand in higher urbanized areas. Climate change comes at a high cost and requires comprehensive mitigation measures and upgrades. So to meet climate goals, reduce the transportation sector's contribution to statewide G greenhouse gas emissions, and prepare for extreme weather events, ODOT and transportation agencies must apply climate change mitigation measures and prepare facilities to withstand climate events throughout the entire statewide transportation system. This does include all geographic regions and sectors. It includes ground passenger and commercial service. It includes freight systems, it includes air passenger systems. Technologies that influence the transportation system are rapidly changing and growing. ODOT must keep up to date on technology trends as well as other partner agencies to understand how these trends will impact the transportation system, especially with regard to modal choice, and how they can be leveraged to improve the user experience and address concerns such as traffic condition or congestion, excuse me, and climate change. Some key drivers of change do produce conflicting trends. For instance, climate change implications are encouraging a reduction in single occupancy vehicle use. On the other hand, emerging personal technologies such as connected autonomous vehicles and on-demand delivery is driving demand for more single occupant vehicle trips and vehicles and fleets themselves. Additional funding is required to prepare the statewide transportation system for an extreme seismic event, I also wanna know. Creative funding mechanisms such as partnering with projects led by local jurisdictions should be leveraged 
to ensure future projects consider and incorporate resiliency in terms of the seismic as well as uh, severe weather disruption related to climate. So this slide, I just want to acknowledge that in terms of an outcome-driven transportation plan, of which Jonathan's gonna expand more on how we consider an outcome-driven OTP. Um, there are certain elements we prescriptively wanted to apply both to the project team and to those, those involved in my executive leadership chain, the Oregon Transportation Commission, and uh, those convening for, uh, in the advisory committees uh, that drove process of the plan. Um, I wanna give credit to the Policy Data Administration Manager of ODOT, Amanda Peets. This is really her North Star guidance towards our approach to the plan. And it really matters that we understand users and use, uses of the system. So it's kind of a way to say, we know this is a human-centered planning uh, uh, plan, and it really is considering uh, how people utilize the system. And the, there's a human connection to uh, the freight system as well. So the vision and values statement is um, on the left. And you see there, or uh, at, the la at the end of that statement, climate-friendly, equitable, and safe way. Those three words constitute, th in, throughout the plan, three lenses that we prescriptively now are, are guiding through the plan for applying in the prioritization of investment decision-making. And we'll kind of, that kind of is touched upon uh, here and there throughout <laughs> this presentation. And the right, the goals on the right are the goals that come, that came out of engagement with our advisory committees for what it is that's gonna support meeting that vision. <clears throat> And with that, I'm going to pass the hat to Jonathan Slayson, and he's going to talk uh, and about a lot of robust tools that we utilize in this process. Great. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, everybody. Uh, well, so where Adam left off is describing the goals of the plan, and these are listed here on the left. So I'll be looking both to the right and on my screen here because I, I do like moving around a little bit. But... Uh, when we're talking about the how, this is really where, where the modeling and the analysis comes to play with the bigger picture about how a statewide plan affects the residents and anybody who lives and works in the state, is that we needed to start to marry the analytical to the, that goal process. So this is a crosswalk that was developed quite early in uh, into the OTP. And we were able to, uh, it was important in any analytical framework to say, well, where are we going? And then how do we get there? And so identifying a goal, so that's what we need to achieve. And then we said, oh, how are we gonna track progress? We first identified those objectives within the goal. So we broke the goals down into a next piece. And what Adam did talk about is that there was probably about six months of effort that was collectively with a broad stakeholder group to identify the goals and then identify these policy objectives that define the goals. And then when we brought in the modeling and analysis team, we said, well, what tools do we have and what tools are we going to leverage on this OTP? And we said, well, how are we going to demonstrate progress toward these measures? And so this crosswalk where it was developed, uh, these are some of the output measures that the tool that we are that we used um, called Vision Eval, it produces a number of outputs. And these were some of the key measures that we identified that could say, we are measuring something that the model helps us identify and analyze that will show progress toward an objective that then will show toward progress toward a goal. So this crosswalk is really important to first uh, keep in mind. Now, Adam mentioned an outcome-driven plan. What does that mean? Is that a traditional, and I say traditional with air quotes because traditional scenario planning is maybe 20 years old. I, I don't really know, uh, is that, it's not all that uh, all that uh, recent where we started doing scenario planning, particularly in the light of a statewide long range plan. And the way that happens is that it's an input driven. This is the traditional approach is that you identify what futures do you want to get to? And you say, well, these are all the inputs to, that, it, that it takes. So you first in that process, you identify, well, what does the future look like in the absence of maybe intervention? So this is our baseline our reference case scenario. 
Then you establish again your measures of effectiveness. Those are all those performance measures on the right hand side of that table is that you need to track how are you going to get there? Are we on the right pathway? Do we need to pivot? And so what happens is that you put those things together and you then say, well, that's not where we want to go. We're going to identify a handful of futures. So this is the normative scenario planning process. Typically, no more than seven, and you identify maybe widely variant futures because you want to have these nice bookends. And you say, well, that's one future, this is another, and this is another. And because they're different, you get a better sense of saying, well, that is a future. Do we want that or not? And it has to be really different from maybe a slightly different future. And so the idea then is that you test those futures against your goals with, with these measures of effectiveness. The problem is you have to iterate again and again and again if you don't quite have those normative futures quite right. So we're leveraging new tools to become output and outcome driven. The first two steps are identical. You identify that future reference case, that base condition of the future. You identify those MOEs that we have. But what is really unique is that we get to focus rather than prescriptive in the future, this is what the future is. We're going to say, what are the dimensions? What are those key drivers of change that we are interested in testing? And we're going to then put a bunch of those together and create combinations of futures using new tools. So what we get to focus on is identifying what are those dimensions and then identifying what are those ranges of those dimensions. And more will that become more clear in a little bit. The benefit, though, is that we get to put those dimensions into a, into a framework to evaluate a wide domain of possible futures. And then we get to mine those futures and say, that future is actually what we like. We might not have ever derived that on our own if we were in the normative alternative. So what this kind of looks like, it's always hard to visualize what this, uh, what this kind of exploratory framework looks like. And I like to call it, it's a quantitative exploratory scenario planning process. There has been a handful of other exploratory planning processes, but typically not using robust analytical tools like we used here. So what does it look like? Is that we've put together all these different dimensions. And what in the, in the typical framework, you model today, you go out to the future and you get a result for that one normative scenario. If you're then doing a little bit of analytical on the side, you can say, well, I'm going to vary one particular input across a little range, put a some stochastic variation to that input. But what we get to do instead is say, well, what about varying 13 different dimensions and say how one particular outcome, and I'm going to use daily VMT, vehicle miles travel, as being the outcome here. Rather than getting one answer or a small range, we actually get this dramatic range in this value because we're testing so many different dimensions. Now that in itself isn't so helpful. So we need to say, well, why is that? Why is that beneficial? Here's a chart though to also illustrate, uh, we have these 500 different dots on this chart here. We have ran this model 500 times across with those 13 different dimensions. And what I want to illustrate is that the total DVMT here on the left is that we have kind of a low value and a high value, and we've got all these dots filling in this continuum. This is just showing one relationship, a two-dimensional plot to say, well, what if we vary one of the dimensions, the urban mixed-use percentage? What if we all live in 100% mixed-use neighborhoods? What this is telling us is that while there's a general downward trend, as we get more dense in mixed-use, we're getting lower DVMT. But there's scenarios that say, even if you lived in a 100% mixed use environment, you're gonna still generate a fair amount of DVMT, daily VMT. So what's going on? It's those, all those other dimensions. And that's what's really informative by, <clears throat> by, the, by the exploratory process. <clears throat> so we did this using this tool called Vision Eval. It's the most robust quantitative strategic travel model. So I say all those terms very uh, precise. They're very different models than what most of us use day in and day out with typical travel demand models that are assignment based. The benefits of this tool is that it can be typically estimated using readily available data. Professor Wong uh, has been a, a key contributor to some of the, the tools here for this, for this model framework. Uh, it's estimated using NHTS data, we are then get to customize that data using local ACS and census from PUMS. 
we get to benefit from HPMS network information, travel surveys, and what's, what is a real benefit is when you do have a travel model, you get to mine that with a lot of data because you already put in your households, your jobs, you know a bunch of information about what's going on out there. But what's particularly unique is that it's based on an econometric estimate of demand. So we have the output being numerous determinant variables, but we have numerous explanatory variables that are sensitive to cost. And that's what we've brought everything into a monetized framework, what accounts for congestion charges, fuel taxes, uh, how does electrification of your vehicle affect how much travel you might demand or consume. So all of that is sensitive in this framework. It's also sensitive to some of the operational tactics is that if you're traveling on your day and you suddenly uh, have a more efficient or faster travel time to work, we might have, that might induce us to take our car a little bit more. So it's sensitive to those types of things. So it runs particularly quickly, 500 scenarios you can run in just a couple hours uh, for a whole state because it doesn't account for every trip individually. It accounts for your daily travel. And so we're not putting the trips onto, onto a network. I, I will note for everybody that this website, I think might be down at a particular moment in time uh, due to a, 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 an issue with some domain servers uh, at, at the feds. But uh, this is a website that FHWA is supporting this tool uh, and a pooled funds. This website hopefully will be active soon. And eventually I think there is an alternative website that we can put in the chat and share with everybody after. <clears throat> So putting this into the context, uh, particularly for Oregon, this is helpful. This is a, a, a toolkit and probably an old graphic, uh, but where does the strategic model fit in the framework of all the tools that we have available at our disposal? I like to start always at the bottom is that we have operational tools, the synchros, the micro simulations, and to say, this is gonna answer really discrete questions. How does this signal operate with this timing? You have all these other assumptions saying how much travel is, is demanded for that signal. And all those things are fixed on all these other assumptions. So we're ignoring all that in that type of operational model. If we go up a level, we're gonna say, well, we're gonna vary a few more things. We're gonna vary land use. We're gonna va vary where you work, maybe uh, how many cars you have at your household. Those are your typical travel demand models. But those are also calibrated to certain assumptions like fuel prices. They're fixed to calibration to certain uh, points in time they're insensitive to the things that the vision eval then starts to accommodate in its choice set. So it's these strategic models that allow you to vary sensitivity to fuel prices. It allows you to say, change how sensitive to you are, are your operational costs of driving or how available is transit to you. So it allows you to ask many more widely varied questions in, in a robust uh, tool. What I particularly like to, as a practitioner using the tool, is that it allows you to identify your high return on investment policies and investments quite early on in the planning process. You don't have to go way down in a planning process to say, well, that's the one investment that gets us where we want to go. You can quite early on and say, well, pricing or TDM policies are really going to move the needle on some of our key objectives. It's been used at LRTPs at both many, uh, several MPOs now have used it, and now uh, a DOT at, at the state level in Oregon. So particularly what was novel in this application is that we developed this model using a constrained environment for a fiscal, a fiscally constrained um, boundary, which was particularly important because we're looking to understand how user fees and how gas taxes and how do we fund and invest in our system in light of the fact of a goal of trying to reduce DVMT, we're actually reducing how much revenue we may collect because we're, we're collecting revenues from our gas taxes. So how do you balance this thing? In a vision eval, you can balance the fact that how many miles are being driven, what's the fuel consumption, what's the gas taxes, we know how many cars are owned and we know the annual registration. All of that informs the revenue that we have as a, as a society to then reinvest back in the system and pay for the investments and policies that we want to achieve. What's also beneficial here is that in that bounded environment, we have these costs with the costs, I would say investments, but we have investments and then we also have this big uh, operational cost. We have preservation and adaptation. We have to fund the system well into the future and not just invest in shiny things. And so we balanced the preservation and adaptation needs within that bounded environment. And it allowed us to, to accommodate for some awareness of feedbacks. If we don't invest in our system, 
we might experience some disadvantages over time. Maybe that bridge will become weight restricted and it's gonna force some longer trips. So we're accounting for some of those disbenefits into this system. Another particular novel uh, piece was this EMAT infrastructure. We applied a, uh, a relatively new software tool called the Exploratory Modeling and Analysis Toolkit that was developed and it was discussed in this document here from the team of, uh, program at FHWA and USDOT, decision-making under deep uncertainty. So we're very fortunate here in Oregon where we have co, uh, I don't know if co-authors, but at least co-reviewers and, and participants with this document. And so it was really a pleasure to be able to uh, apply this really robust uh, quantitative exploratory tool for, for Oregon. So some of the methodology for how we actually did all this. The first piece is typical of any travel modeling process is that we validated the current tool. We were able to pick up a, a, an existing tool. We validated to current conditions. We did some updates. We updated some of the, the core travel demand pieces to reflect some data from the 2017 NHDS. Maybe we'll have to update that now that the new data is coming out. Uh, we updated some automated vehicle modules as well as awareness of teleworking. So we brought in some new capabilities to the tool. We then developed that relationship, that linkage that I mentioned about costs and revenue and developed that financially bounded scenario. We then identified the inputs to the tool. And those are those practical ranges of those dimensions. We did that by gathering input both from regional and state plans that preceded this, this OTP. Well, what did the old OP, OTP say? What is all the other MPOs and regions go, what are they planning to invest in for the next 30 years? So we brought all these in and we're gonna call those levers. These are the things that we, that we could affect in, in our model. We then built this into the vision eval tool. So the vision eval tool is our number crunching. This is, should have a bunch of gears here. That's what you typically see. That's the, that's the how. Then what we produced out of the vision eval is the outputs, literally 500 um, scenarios. What happens then is that we are able to use machine learning techniques in the EMAT infrastructure to develop meta models. So we not only used a model, we then produced 500 scenarios. We then built a model on top of those 500 scenarios. And the meta model, what it does is it produces this relationship between the input dimensions. If I am, I don't have a nice table to show you. So you have to, on, the, on all the rows are all the input dimensions. And then on the columns are all the performance measures that we identified. So this big matrix gives you each of these relationships. And that's what the meta model allowed us, it, it produced for us. And so we were able to then benefit from that on the next couple of slides, I'll show you how, is to say what inputs got us to our outcomes that we are really most interested in. So quickly on some of the ranges of inputs here, we evaluated a variety of dimensions, 13 specific dimensions, but they are all kind of different flavors of these key, uh, key topics. Land use density, roadway capacity, active travel investments, transit revenue miles and frequency, as well as electrification of the vehicle fleet. And then how does travel options or travel demand management get accounted for? So we varied these across very practical uh, limits, let's say. We, we didn't go out and say, well, what if we just put transit four times all across the state? We were, I think, more practical and, and realistic about some of these dimensions, which then would give us practical ways to, to get to the policy side and then actually implementation. Now, thinking about implementation, and we talked about how we introduced some new capabilities to the model, there's a phase two that actually is currently underway to talk about how do exogenous uncertainties affect the ability to reach our goals. The phase one levers across those different dimensions allowed us to say what level of these inputs were best to achieve our goal in a particular fiscal environment. We now get to say, well, in the phase two piece, well, what if what if non-human driven, fully driverless vehicles start to proliferate around the network? Is that gonna challenge our DVMT goals and our GHG goals or could it enhance it? Uh, what about teleworking rates? What if we go back to pre-COVID teleworking or what if we actually went back to a peak teleworking rate? How does that also affect our, the ability to reach our goals? These are other topics that we've explored, electrification, uh, dramatic increases in vehicle electrification, fuel price shocks, 
And so it's really about a uh, making our implementation strategies in the OTP more resilient to uncertainties. So that's what we were able to bring in as well. So a little bit of how we got there. I talked about how we had these meta models and bringing out all these scenarios that the meta models actually produce 16,000 experiments or samples. You could make more than you ever want. And what it really does is it just fills in all the gaps that that plot that I had with the scatter with the 500 dots. If with the meta model, it just would basically fill it just into a big, big broad brush because you have 16,000 dots on that same chart. Yeah, what we had to do though is to mine, how do you mine 16,000 scenarios? And then we actually did that four times because we use different funding levels. So what we had to do is develop this, this framework. We built a little shiny app and that app allowed us to upload a, a CSV of all those 16,000 rows for each funding level. And what we used is that meta model relationship between the outputs and then how those outputs are connected to which inputs. So we first uploaded the CSV to this tool. Then what we did is, I'll show you this next one, let's a little zoom in. Uh, these are each of the goals and safety is one of the goals. It was decided through some of the public engagement efforts that, that Adam mentioned about that, the balanced outcome, which meant each of the goals was identified as equally weighted. That was something that we explored through this process. What if we weighted safety more than anything? What if we weighted GHG and equity more than anything? What the public engagement pieces told us is that they said, well, we like a balanced outcome. We want to achieve all of our goals equally. We spent six months working on these goals. We like them. So we wanted to try to achieve them. So what we did here is allow us to give equal weight to all the goals. And we have measures and, um, and performance outputs or objectives, excuse me, and performance measures within each of the goals is that everything was norm, uh, normalized so that at the end of the day, every goal was equal weighting, and but some goals had more uh, measures under them than others. So this tool kind of brought us into the framework of, of reflecting how each of those, those measures were, were uh, reflected. Now, a little bit more of the how, and I'm, I, I wanna move us along, but we, we looked at the outcomes of the model. Now, uh, another question of how is that, how do you consider outcomes that vary between scales of like one to 10 and then other things are like 0.1 and then other out outputs are like 16 million? How do you bring that into a framework? What we decided to do is normalize them and put them into bins of, in this case, 15 bins. And so you got a score of 15 if you were an output that met your goal the best. So a DVMT per capita in the, in, in the goals of we want to reduce our daily vehicle miles traveled. The particular um, scenarios or experiments out of the 16,000 rows, which rows gave us the best or the lowest VMT per capita got a score of 15. So that's basically how we kind of brought this into a normalized framework and all of the measures in this big table could be compared to each other. So we have this product of these scores of 15s, and then we have the weights that we established to those criteria. We did a little bit of just an, a weighting exercise and we got a score for each of the 16,000 rows. We then ranked those scores and we identified which out of the 16,000 rows on the table, which one rose to the top as best achieving our goals at the end of the day. We then mined, uh, you can imagine now that table just goes on to the left and we said, well, these are the top five rows. What were the inputs that got us there? So this is a, a way to try to describe those inputs. We have the team imp environment that I mentioned. One unique kind of, and it makes it a little bit hard to communicate is that we have a low and a high in, that, in this exploratory framework. And it uses value between zero and one to represent the low and the high. So this chart allows us to communicate to say, well, at the end of the day, if we have a certain amount of money, which up here, we have a current funding, a little bit more, double the funding, and what if we actually uh, had about four times the funding available to us? How would our investments change? What this allowed us to do is to say, well, let's say in travel demand management, if we had more funding, we would fund it in different rates. What about lane miles? How many lane miles would we like to build if we had different funding levels? And this table allows us to explore and communicate how that changes. 
Now, what I want to mention about the red dots here, this min and max, is that what if we prioritized those other goals over each other? So what if we only prioritized GHG reduction? It would change our investment strategy. And so that's what these red dots are. They're a handful of other kind of more sensitivity tests to say, how would the investments change if we really prioritize other objectives? So you get a much more varied range here. Uh, active travel, for instance, in one scenario, you maybe not prioritize that nearly at all. And then one scenario, you'd basically max it out. So it all depends on your outcomes, your objectives. So my last slide, then turning over to Adam to talk about where, where we're ending up, is that at the end of the day, the OTP is a change in our investment philosophy as a state, and that in the absence of the OTP, we would have not realized these goals to the same level that we, that we hope to. Is that, for instance, uh, one of the key goals is daily vehicle miles per travel, per capita travel. If we were stuck in our reference and our adopted and our current trajectory, is that we're showing that we uh, basically stay flat where we are today. If we change our investment strategies, we're showing that we can reduce the DVMT per capita. That's a key outcome. We're also seeing that we can increase our funding for preservation and adaptation. We realized through the OTP that was a key need in our, in our state. We needed to prioritize that investment area. So we have other outcomes and other, uh, other outcomes here that vary depending on the prioritization and, um, and the level of investment that we're able to make in the OTP. So thanks. Thanks a lot, John. I will try to uh, keep moving fast to preserve our Q&A time. Um, <laughs> this slide represents how the technical scenario analysis work informed public involvement in the decision-making <laughs> process and then vice versa. This is definitely a two-way relationship. Uh, I just want to draw back to when I mentioned the uh, analytical tool of uh, transportation personas. Uh, what we saw with that tool was the strength of developing synthetic populations. And with the geographic resolution of the tool, it's enabling us to communicate how Oregonians may experience a transportation system under these scenarios that we've been talking about. Um, the scenario analysis was used to provide information for moving conversations forward. The analysis didn't produce detailed prescriptive steps. It was not used to develop actual projects. The OTP is a high level strategic plan uh, implemented through uh, actions in the plan itself, as well as the uh, modal and topic plans I discussed up front. So what we heard back and learned, um, leadership really gravitated on the balanced outcome scenario because it, it was about optimizing across the six OTP goals. Um, it was recommended by the Policy Coordinating Committee. That was our chief steering in, uh, entity, uh, represented a wide swath of Oregonians uh, in the plan. Uh, and it was the chief advisory body making recommendations. They recognized that some outcomes could have been strengthened, but the impact of balancing across the six OTP goals was found in, 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 from our tool or our analytical results. A uh, public comment period that concluded actually earlier this spring um, were really more oriented in, in supporting the blue sky scenario uh, that was imagining the equivalence fees of four times uh, current levels in order to prioritize certain OTP goals over others. Um, there were certainly observed tensions uh, from the findings and results of our scenario work. Um, you know, goals around reducing VMT capital outcomes certainly contrast with trying to find improvements in, in measures of travel time, reliability, and other mobility measures. Um, so current status and a look ahead. As I said, we are certainly on the other side of the proverbial wormhole because uh, we got the OTP adopted uh, July 13th of this year. Plan implementation is underway. That's chiefly where my work is now uh, in my role uh, for the agency. Um, OTP policies and scenarios are already informing investment priorities. I list the 2730 Statewide Transportation Improvement Program, or STIP, that's the state's capital improvement program. They have set from the start that those three lenses I articulated from the vision of prioritizing safety, equity, and climate 
are fronting where we are going to make decisions in the STIP on discretionary funding investment priorities. And I just want to mention that we anticipate in early 2025, when the state legislature convenes for its measure session, that they're going to take up a potential new uh, major transportation package. And this work in different ways will be uh, built into uh, messaging for the governor's office, for uh, ODOT leadership, and eventually to the Joint Committee on Transportation, uh, understanding what it means for prioritizing through those three lenses. And Jonathan, you could touch on continuing analysis, and that would probably uh, conclude and hopefully uh, allow for some Q and A time. Yeah, I think uh, Adam, I think it really touched on is that on those uncertainties is that we plan on connecting both where we are today to the future. So the the step is part of that pathway of where we are today to the future, but also then making those policies resilient to those exogenous uncertainties that we identify. So whether the work continues to identify um, what the effects of those those uncertainties are and to make our policies resilient. And that concludes. So however we facilitate Q&A, uh, Dr. Wong and Becca, we're here. Great, thank you all. Uh, you are correct. I'm going to have a little bit of a kind of fact I can share with you is that uh, they're, they present the work at the uh, TRV trans Travel Innovation and, now, and Planning uh, Conference, I believe in the past June, and they got the great best presentation uh, award. You can see why it's only a very high uh, integration of both very high level Epistemology, and epistemology uh, as Adam presented in very technical aspects of the work and then uh, on and then all those apply to a very uh, influential uh, project. So great, congrats. Any questions? A question about the transportation persona uh -huh. and the population. Like my imagination for like, what are you talking about? Was Google over the map? So like, I didn't know. But the first thing I can find is that like, is that kind of like the archetypes created around bicycling, like the cautious. The maybe would be bicyclistic. Like, is that a. There, there's some analogous tie there. Okay. Um, it was certainly to use actual um, understood population demographic data to build a, a, a persona, but also recognize their pers uh, respective geography, where they live, mm -hmm. and understand other kinds of segmentation of. Of is it is it someone who's under twenty one? Is it uh, is it a senior? Um, are they, what what kind of communities might they be living in? Uh, are they disadvantaged groups? Uh, or and also, it, what type of work might they do? So it was really trying to use the, that synthetic development with some precision ability of where they lived to then say, well, this is how this person may be impacted by the scenarios. And to be sure, we use narratives to tell those stories of those personas that we built and identified. So I wouldn't say uh, it wasn't quite a topology uh, of, of, a, of a user, but it was a, a user that we would hope someone in, who would be reviewing the, uh, the work through our online open house would see themselves as I can relate to what they're talking about of how the scenario is impacting me, uh, them as someone like me. So that's really what it was. So like kind of fleshing out some archetypes of transportation experiences. That I, that's a good way to put it. Okay. Yeah, okay. that's right. That's cool. Well, thank you. <laughs> that's a good question really. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a tool that I would hope we utilize a bit more uh, across the agency because it felt somewhat novel in actually 
generating it and then using it to tell tell stories of an uncertain future for sure yes um, yeah i also wanted to say about the transportation but and um, first of all i thought it was really interesting to put it in different geographic space uh -huh. the visual to the visual but um was it as you said is it was it more like a communication tool to make it for public or did you also use it to as part of the like analytical process that's a good question because I would say it was both, but in distinct ways. So first, we needed to build them and put it into the into an online open house as a communication tool. But then we wanted to utilize a feedback instrument in that online tool so that people would then tell us, "What do you think?" Uh, if you, you you know utilizing these personas and stepping through the narratives that we built in the website tool. And the, what was reflected back was what was uh, they would relate of, well, this this scenario to me, based on what you related with these personas, is what I gravitate around and would prefer. Yes. I liked how you translated everything into a dollar amount that the state should target spending to reach the top scoring scenarios. I'm thinking specifically about those those bars and those ranges. What is the next step of you go from, okay, well, we have this amount of money set aside for projects. How do you pick the projects? Because I'm sure you could spend all the money and maybe some of the projects would be more effective than others. So how do you select the, the projects to fill out that budget that you've established? I would... Um probably spend two hours on that one, but <laughs> let's let's draw back to where uh, near the conclusion when I talked about how the OTP and those uh, three lenses that uh, front your, the, the prioritization of investments for the 2730 STIP, the Trans Statewide Transportation Approval Program, um, the STIP development is really about uh, where you're going to put weight on your allocations, where you're going to put emphasis uh, across certain buckets, right? And those buckets are aligned to the things we know we have to do through regulatory uh, mandates of what we can spend, but also the discretionary part. There is there is evaluation criteria behind where you, where they are going to. Um, propose those allocations for the ultimate adoption of the 2730 STIP. And that evaluation criteria is just starting to become uh, publicly related to the Oregon Transportation Commission and to, the, and, and to the public at large, where we're looking to things such as using heat map type uh, geographic, geospatial analytical tools to recognize where are these areas that, you know, looking at the OTP six goal areas, uh, we're finding uh, they're not, uh, or they're, they're scoring in one, whatever directionality we, we choose to put it in terms of, of um, or is, is this a critical safety location, right? Um, is, this, is this something where all of the policies that we have around safety in the OTP uh, that are under a um, safe systems approach, and and perhaps we uh, perhaps safe systems has been presented to PC uh, Trek before in the webinar series. But if y'all don't know, that's FHWA's kind of rubric guidance on complete uh, approach to safety. Um, it's really about scoring those metrics, but it had to start in terms of evaluating them for the development of projects for scoping, it has to start from the OTP three lenses uh, of safety, equity, and climate. And when John talked about the continuing work, we're gonna help inform that in terms of outcomes. We do have one online question um, and it's about uh, safety and vulnerable road users. So this person has noted that the safety goals that you kind of presented were all automotive focused and they're wondering about vulnerable road user safety and if you analyze that as a part of increasing their trips. And if so, did you find that centering the vulnerable road user safety affected other areas such as vehicular safety, transit, et cetera? That, 
That's I will just start to say that's a really good follow up of when I made mention of safe systems approach because safe systems absolutely centers vulnerable users uh, as a, 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 in terms of where we go on the policies and strategies uh, that are found in the plan. But then I'll turn to John of how we uh, consider that in our scenarios. Right. Yeah, I think there was an emphasis the measures there. The, there are crash rates that are baked into the vision eval model based on Oregon specific data on bike incidents, uh, fatals and serious injuries per trips or per rate of, of travel. And so we did look at those. I, honestly, the crash rates for the vehicles were just so much more numerous, unfortunately, that it, that it did move the needle where the crash rates on the bicycle trips, we just don't have enough trips to... Basically, if we pulled that lever and really influenced the outcome on that one, we weren't seeing the outcomes. So the bottom line is that we saw safer systems result if we lower our DVMT per capita. So that was a key objective is, is we focused on the vehicles where we also then downstream benefit. So there were a number, number of co-benefits when we analyzed this. Okay. Make sure the students got all their questions. Go ahead. So uh, as a transportation planning professional and an Oregon resident, I can't resist asking Adam, I think, to delve a little more deeply into the decision-making stakeholder framework in which you operated, by which I mean specifically, you've got, to my view, a rather complex environment where you are an executive branch agency under the governor. The OTC is the decision-making body who adopted the plan, and yet, as your implementation slide pointed out, the legislature now has to bring funding forward. So I'm curious how you and the planning team navigated the decision-making environment, and if, for example, the legislators were consulted during plan development, so they had a heads up that they were going to be asked to align funding to certain priorities. Well, I'll first say, if I was the... Uh, emperor, if you will, of transportation. <laughs> I would have a very elegantly stated way that I make that happen. But instead, I'm going to have to kind of speak somewhat of positional authority in terms of also how we did, uh, how we uh, brought certain executive level leadership to the decision making table, but then how we haven't act, gotten really on the ground yet with say the joint committee and transportation. So the, the policy coordinating committee that I alluded to uh, before earlier in the presentation, which was the chief steering body uh, to making recommendations in the plan, actually was chaired by then Oregon Transportation Chair, Norm, or Mr. Van Brocklin. And that was at least our way of ensuring that within his capacity, he not only is uh, listening and advising accordingly within his role on that committee, that offline he goes and, and he informed the other Oregon Transportation Commissioners at points throughout the process. That was very important, of course, for the ability to get them uh, to um, have their recommendation to adopt the plan in that culminating moment in July of this year. Now we have ODOT has a government relations uh, executive and uh, Lindsey Baker, and so there was some, there were touch points in some aspect of being able to uh, get this information at certain and certain milestone points to her too, because her role is really to be a, the conduit to the governor's office and then to the joint committee. I'll note though. During Governor Brown's tenure, there really wasn't that uh, transportation advisor uh, role that we now know we have under Governor Kotek. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that person is really instrumental for um, being a part of where we're going to go on implementation. Put another way, we're going to tr we're going to ensure that the governor's office is um, given the, the, this kind of messaging, these kind of briefings of what's gonna drive prior, the prioritization of investments in, of a, of, in a long range 
but also thinking in terms of short term up to four years, mid term 10, et cetera. We get that buy in and then we'll go. That's Kelly Brooks, by the way. And uh, we then need to get their buy in to move to the Joint Committee of Transportation to understand that's the same guiding element behind what they're going to take up. Uh, there's a lot more I can say about that because the some of the nuance John related does need to be conferred to them to understand uh, what prioritization and trade-offs really mean here. Uh, and we'll see. We'll see. I anticipate 2024 is going to be a lot of that. Thanks. Hey. Uh... Thank you all for attending. Uh, so for those of you attending online, you have the opportunity to give us feedback. We appreciate that. If you spend a few minutes finishing those. And uh, thank you so much, Alan thank and you. Uh, for your presentation. Thank you for joining us today.